Um, there we go. Hi, everyone. This is Margaret Hirsch, you at Home with Hirsch. Just thank you for joining us today. And girls, you can live stream if you want to as well. And we are talking today about wellness. Now, wellness is, encompasses so much. It encompasses your, your physical body, your mental health, most importantly today. And that's what we're going to be focusing on a lot because we find that people don't want to ask for help for mental health. And they, they feel that there's a bit of a stigma attached. They don't know who to ask. And funny enough, I was talking to a psychologist on the weekend and I said, I told her about connectability and I said, you know, we've got this amazing webinar coming on. And she said, oh my goodness. She said, I wish I'd known about that because I'm giving advice and handing people out to different specialists. Now, I think we would have to realize that with mental health today, you need a specialist in your field of mental health. Where, where are you at? And you need to know who to go to. He's going to put you right the first time. You don't want to have a whole lot of people messing around with you even more. And I think that's where Stacey comes in. And Stacey, come on in and tell us a little bit about connectability and about our fantastic speaker today. Come on in. Oh, thank you so much, Margaret. So um, Connectable Life is a mind, body and wellness platform that has um, almost 95 different specialists, Paula being one of our specialists, Paula is going to be talking with us today. And um, on Connectable Life, you can find exactly what you are looking for. So if you're looking for a um, counsellor, somebody who specialises in anxiety, for instance, there are those on Connectable Life. No matter what the topic is, on Connectable Life, you will be able to find the specialist that you are looking for. So like for today, we are going to be discussing um, goals and relationship goals. And so we've got our incredible specialist, Paula, with us. He's going to be discussing that. And together with Margaret, Margaret, you're such a wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much for having us um, and opening the space for wellness and mental health and just allowing people to have this in road to hearing more about these fields and topics. So um, Connectable Life is an all-on-one platform. It's all online. So somebody will go online, they'll choose the field they're looking for. They'll find the specialist they're looking for online and they'll then book and pay for that specialist. And then when the time comes, they'll book back onto Connectable and have the consultation through Connectable Life. So nothing is, um, off the platform, everything is in one space. And that's what we've tried to do. We've tried to make it so easy for people to find the help that they are needing. So today, uh, Paula is going to be gracing us with her wonderful knowledge. Thank you, Paula. And um, Paula is a growth mindset catalyst, relationship and life coach. So on to you, thank you, Paula. Thanks, Stacey, and hello, Margaret. It's so awesome to be here. Um, I can definitely recommend Connectable Life Platform. I've been on the platform since inception, and it's been so awesome to be a part of your journey and just see how you've grown this platform to such an amazing resource for people all over the world to access and get the help that, that they need. And Margaret, to be with you again, um, gee, I, I can't even remember how many years it's been since we've been in each other's spaces and that, and yeah, every time I still learn so much more from you and um, I'm looking forward to this session as well. Yeah, no, Paula, it's lovely. Now, um, I know that your speciality is relationships, and I think relationships are the most important thing. Last week, we spoke a bit about health, which is number one, I believe. Secondly, um, I, the reason I wanted you to speak about relationships is I believe that your relationship, especially with your partner, will bring you 99% of your happiness or your unhappiness. When you think, when are you really happy? When you're really there, you connect to just the two of you. And I've been married now, I'll be 50 years in April. So I can tell you, and I speak from experience, it was so worthwhile going through the tough times and I was very fortunate because my husband is very very easy going um, it, but we did go through a couple of hard times along the way but it was so worthwhile working through those hard times to get to the good times and there's nothing better than having been with a person for 50 years who you know loves you unconditionally who accepts you for exactly who you are who doesn't want you to be any difference but to me the biggest um, attribute that my husband had is he gave me the freedom to do what I wanted to do what is your advice to people to come to you and say listen my relationship isn't going the way I want to so Margaret, just to come back to congratulating you, first of all, on 50 years of marriage, because that is that is a lifetime. And, and why I say that is because I'm turning 50 in January, believe it or not. So you've oh, been wow. married as long as I've been around. Yeah, that's <laughs> a long time. <laughs> so, so congrats on that. Um, definitely relationships 
uh, both personal and professional relationships are our biggest source of support and our biggest source of nurturing and care and get providing us with a platform where we can do the things that we want to do as an individual but yeah. also collectively as a couple and a family unit, which spills over into our professional space as well to achieve the goals that we have in our professional world. Mm. And a lot of couples don't set a strong foundation for their relationship when it comes to the kind of lifestyle that they want to live, um, but at the same time, allow each other to be their own person. So key to a successful relationship, which you've already alluded to, is being your own person, accepting each other as, as, as an individual, but then coming together with intention and co-creating that us, we, ours, which is where your relationship lives, and then your family unit around that. Yes. So it's key to our, our well-being. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I mean, there's nothing better than a happy family. And I've got a sign above my door that says family isn't everything. It's the only thing. And at the end of the day, when you think about it, when we went into lockdown, how bad it was and how the families have stuck together. One of my guys who works with me came to me and he said, you know, madam, I have to spend six weeks with my family. And I actually find they're quite nice. I said, I'm so <laughs> glad you like them. Imagine if you didn't like them. So I think COVID really brought out the families that, that knitted together, but it also separated the families that were just hanging in there. I'm just eating and sleeping and, and staying in the same house with you, but we really have nothing in common anymore. Um, what's your feeling with that? Very much so, Margaret. We've definitely seen the impact of COVID. The divorce stats have spiked globally as well as locally. And I've seen it because I do work with a few divorce attorneys um, around trying to you know, help couples navigate that road in terms of either trying to save their relationship or to part in, in a way. So we call it um, conscious uncoupling. So to part in a way where there's love and light and grace and you can still allow each other to be in it's a healing journey, especially where children are involved, because you're still going to have to be a part of each other's lives regardless. So definitely um, it's key to our well-being. Um, when you're not in a good space in your personal relationship, it does spill over into the workplace and it does affect your ability to be productive and creative and just function on normal day-to-day -day activities. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's just so important that people realize that if you are unhappy at home, you'll be unhappy at work and your whole life is unhappy. And why do we do all this? We do it just to be happy. That's the whole crux. That's why we are working for money so we can get things that will make us happy. But we have to work on those relations, which is so, so important. It's something you really can't buy. Although a lot of people go into Tinder today, but we have some successes, but a lot of them aren't. Um, but I just think let's just work at relationships and say, for, for me, the saying goes, um, you don't have to attend every argument you're invited to. And I've just had a friend stay with me. She's been married for 52 years. And I just said to her, what's the secret of your success? And she said, we just don't argue. We just decided that we don't argue. And I was talking to my daughter about it this weekend. And she said, you know, mom, you give your partner quite a lot of grace. You can't be picking them up for everything that they do that you don't like. You have to give them grace. Stacey, what do you feel about that? Yeah, no, I agree 1000% because um, I've been with my husband for 14 years now and we've been together since we were 16 and we made a decision <laughs> that we were going to every couple of years do a marriage course or see a counsellor and just go through some things that um, if ever things weren't so great or if the other person isn't you know, 100% happy about certain things. It allows you the space to talk and to open things up. And so I really believe in before things ever get bad to actually give yourself that space to talk through things with somebody. So um, a few years ago, I mean, we weren't struggling, we weren't going through anything, but we just said, let's just bounce ideas off of a specialist. And that was, a, again, one of the things that led us to Connectable, because we needed to just um, have like a, a mediator in some subject choices that we needed and financial decisions we were making and um, just decisions around making um, raising kids as well so I believe that no matter where you at you can always improve and so if you guys if people are finding that they are having a little bit of a rough time and they're not getting on you can do something about it don't just stay there don't let it get bad 
you know, don't, you know, they say the statistic is people only go and seek help after two and a half years of struggling in a marriage. And by that case, very often, they are not wanting to resolve it. They're not wanting to actually make it right. Whereas if you can go and get help right at the beginning, that will change everything. What are your thoughts? You're on mute. <laughs> I think Shane mutes me all the time. Um, I think that one of the things is that um, you, you, you've got to do it straight away. And if you say something, you can't unsay it. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. In, in haste and in anger, they say something. And once it's said, you can never unsay it. So I always say to people, don't say it. And what my, I do is I write letters to the person but I never ever give it to them so I write them and I get all my feelings out onto paper and you know get it you know I think this is this and this and then I burn it and it's gone and then I've got it off my chest and they don't even know about it and we can go forward happily Paula when you get to a person and they've come in and they've really said some nasty things to each other that they can't unsay what do you say to them why the hell did you come to me sooner <laughs> yeah yeah, unfortunately, that is a reality um, that Stacey alluded to is a lot of couples leave it until it's too late. There's too much damage done in terms of the hurt and the pain and the anger. And it's far more difficult to forgive. Yeah. And, and so when, when couples do come to me and, and there's a situation like this, the first thing before we can even start on fixing the relationship is working with forgiveness. Because if mm -hmm. you can't get around that hurt and that pain and you can't get closure on that incident, you're not going to be able to move forward. You're going to be stuck in that past. And so it's helping find what that means for that individual and that couple in terms of resolving that yeah. and forgiveness. And a lot of people think that, you know, forgiveness means I have to accept and condone what you've done or what's happened. And that's not the case. Yes. Forgiveness is acknowledging that this happened and yes. how it's made me feel. So I'm hurt, I'm angry, I'm disappointed, I'm let down, whatever it is. What yeah. needs to happen for me to get closure on this? Do I need an apology? Do I need... Um, something else. Do I need it? Do I have unanswered questions? I'm a ring. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what, what do I need to get that closure for me to, to have the, the closure that it's been dealt with, that, that it's been resolved? And then what are the actions that we need to put in place to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Yes. So that's now, the process that I work with. Talk to me about trust, because if anybody had to let me down like that, I wouldn't trust them again. No matter, I could forgive them, I, but I would not forget. How do you get over that hurdle? Trust is a big thing, Margaret, both in personal and professional relationships. And when the space, the relationship space, so the space between two people is where your relationship lives. And yes. if that space doesn't feel trusted, you're not going to be open and honest and transparent and communication and all of those things. So research has shown that it can take up to two years to rebuild trust in a relationship. Now, it depends on the severity of the incident that happened that caused this mistrust, because we trust people on very different levels. For example, infidelity is often the big one that comes out, you know, but it's understanding what that means. So cheating in your world could be, well, the fact that you did the deed with somebody is cheating. In, yeah. in your partner's world, it could be, well, the fact that you were texting someone behind my back, that's cheating. So yeah. first of all, you need to get very clear on where you stand with each other on what those boundaries and those non-negotiables and those deal breakers are, and then start working with rebuilding the trust. Now, it's a process on both sides, but often what happens is the person that feels like they were the one that was, that, that, that was done wrong to, they mm -hmm. kind of point the finger and go, well, you've got to show me I can trust you again. And yes. they keep punishing this person yes. because of what they've done. They don't realize that they have to take ownership of their role as well and go, well, I have to start learning to trust this person and giving them the benefit of the doubt. So it's a two-way process when it comes to rebuilding trust. Now, I have a lot of people who, who work for me. I have 2,500 staff and they, they often have affairs and the, then the wife who's the wounded party will phone me and say, my husband had an affair with somebody at work and, you know, what kind of a place is this? And I say, well, I didn't even know what was going on, you know. And then, and I say to the woman, you know, it's your job to look after your husband. When I married my husband, I said to him, I will look after you better than anybody else ever will. And then, but in turn, you must look after me better than anyone else ever will. And I will make, always make sure you've got a, you know, a, a hot meal, a warm bed, a nice home to come to. I won't moan at you for nothing, you know, and, but you in turn must, must reciprocate. So where does that, where does that whole situation go wrong? Do, do you think couples don't have that conversation? And Stacey, I'm going to ask you this question. 
question. Do couples not have that conversation or um, is it just sort of, they don't want to talk about it because it's a bit tender and then that's when the trouble starts. Yeah, I mean, I guess every couple is different and therefore, and every person is different. So, you know, maybe one, um, like you're saying, the one party is not necessarily meeting the needs that the other party is expecting. And I mean, I've got quite a few friends who have either had affairs and have managed to resolve things or have um, actually are getting divorced or have gotten divorced. And it's a case of lack of communication, in my opinion. So my opinion is that somewhere there was a break of communication, somewhere there was a little offense or a hurt or a resentment that crept in. And without it being resolved, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, I also found that very often one party will say to the other party, I'm not happy, let's go for counseling, let's do something about this. And the other party will say, no, we absolutely fan, I don't want to go for counseling, I don't think we need counseling. <laughs> and they, it just starts to snowball and the end result is either an affair and, or a divorce. Um, so yeah, I think from my side, I always think it's a lack of communication some way. And yeah. um, so that possibly is the start is to have those, like with when they say, you know, have a date night, you don't necessarily have to have a date night, but make, a t make time for each other, prioritize time yeah. to be together where you actually have those conversations. And even if they're hard, rather the hard conversations where healing can happen, then no conversations and then a breakup altogether. What is your, your thoughts, Paula? Yeah, definitely. I mean, communication equals connection. So when you, there's no communication, there's very little connection happening between the two of you. And when there's no connection, your needs are not being met. And needs being, I'm not feeling important, valued, appreciated, a priority. I'm feeling invisible. I'm feeling neglected. So your needs are not being met as well. Nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, today I'm going to have an affair. And the first person that crosses my path, that's the person <laughs> I'm having an affair with. We don't do that. Yeah. It, affairs happen over time because your relationship is breaking down over time because yeah. you haven't made your relationship in each other a priority and then the, often the person that's that's been the one that's had the affair is the one that's punished and the other person is very reluctant to own up and go but how did I co-create the space that my yeah. partner had to go and have an affair how was I not meeting those needs and vice versa? And then couples get stuck in this blame, the blame game and they, they, nothing gets resolved and then they end up breaking up over the relationship and they carry that baggage into their next relationship. Yeah. And that's what the next thing I was going to say is often you've chosen the wrong person or you, you've done something wrong, but you go and you make that same mistake again and again and again. One of my best friends has been married five times and and I just see the pattern going and I just, I, and in fact, another friend just got divorced and she phoned me to say she's going to be married and I met the fellow and I thought, oh my gosh, you just replaced one rotten person with another rotten person, you know, you don't want to do that. What, what do you say to people? And I say to them, you've got to go, if you're going through a divorce, go and get professional help. One, to try and save your marriage, because I always believe you, you should try and save the marriage. You now, when you get to my age and and a lot of the friends that we had who got divorced and married other people and you know alan's got a friend who's his age right now which is 74 who married his secretary who was much much younger had more children and now he's got little children the same age as my grandchildren and he's going through this whole thing he said he said to us one day he said margaret if i had my life over, i would have stuck with my old wife she was a bit of a pain in the hospital could have got over it and i wouldn't have all these hassles now you know running the father's race when i'm 75 when it, you know, it's just it's too much so, yeah, it's, it's such a difficult one and to know where that actually stops and starts. When do you decide this is a breakup and when do you decide we can carry on with it? Paula, do you want to answer that one? Yeah. So, Margaret, definitely. I mean, I firmly believe, and when I do work with couples, that every relationship can be saved if both partners are willing to do the work to make a change. One person alone cannot save the relationship because just as it takes two to make a relationship, it takes two to break a relationship. Yeah. So definitely, um, if you don't do the work, you are going to carry it into your next relationship and repeat the patterns and the cycle and the baggage all over again. 
where I say uh, walk away from the relationship um, is where there's any form of abuse. Any form of abuse, mental, verbal, emotional, physical, sexual, whatever, is unacceptable. And your mental health and well-being and your safety and that of your kids is first priority. And so if you are in that kind of a situation, absolutely, it's in your best interest to let it go. But also there's situations where, you know, one plus one personal party is really trying everything in their power to fix yeah. the relationship, but they have an unwilling partner. Yeah. And then you have a choice to either accept, and, and often people say this is settling, I'm settling for second best, because your needs are not going to be met, and that can cause resentment and, and frustration and anger and hurts and pain. It can be a, a toxic relationship as well. But often people will stay, and, and I'm generalizing primarily from a female perspective because of you know financial reasons and, and being a single parent and the primary parent of children and you know having to take care of that responsibility and all of those kind of things but if your partner is unwilling to fix the relationship and work on it there's not a lot that you can do um and and invariably say, leave with yeah. your dignity just take your dignity and leave but here comes the, the crunch and why i want all women to be financially independent because if you're not financially independent you can't do that you can't just well i say you can't but i still say you can just walk out because there'll be somebody who will take you and until you get on your feet you've got to go and get a job but some to a lot of women it's easier to stay at home with an abusive husband who now provides roof over your head food on your table and a father to your children um, then go out and do it on your own. And that's the big crunch for women. But I do believe if you're financially independent, you can get yourself an au pair, you can move to a nice house, you can take, you know, if you, even if you've got to leave all the stuff with him, you can buy yourself new stuff. And I, that is why it's vitally important for women to be financially independent, because if you are, you can move. If you're not, you can't. And that's a big problem. But to, I say to people, the minute the person starts um, pulling you down rather than pushing you up, that's the time to go. Because if he's not building you up, but often, isn't it that the man is feeling insecure? And I know, especially with our African people, they told me this, that the man is always the head of the house, but now he loses his job and he feels insignificant. The wife is still working. She's now becomes the breadwinner and he feels insecure and insignificant. And that's when he starts to, to beat her up to show his prominence and his superiority over her. And I say, well, if I was her, then I'd get the hell out of there. But she says, look, I've, you know, she's part of my children. I don't want to leave him. How do you balance that up? Yeah, and, you know, this is where the whole sort of gender stereotyping and gender roles play a large um, part in relationships. And I, I'm also finding that it's generational. So our sort of generation upwards, we grew up with that the man was the provider, the protector and the head of the household. And, you know, the woman's job was to take care of the, the family and running of the household. And, and I'm generalizing when I say that, whereas now with the more sort of younger generations coming through, it is becoming a lot more of a level playing field because women have had a lot more opportunities in terms of careers, they're more financially independent, they're more emotionally independent. When it comes to, to um, interracial or multicultural relationships, you have to take in that cultural nuance as well because it does play such a large role um, It's you know in, in those relationships. But uh, having serious conversations and understanding expectations of self and the relationship and of each other as partners and what does that look like if you're yeah. willing to work through it and around it you can find a way and as you said earlier you don't have to show up to every fight you can do yeah. that wisely <laughs> yeah i think now now i want to talk about love languages because i'm a great believer in love languages and, and i couldn't believe i was really old when i found out about them and i'll just give you for instance when we first were going out my husband was earning 25 rand a week when i married him he was earning less when we were going out and he bought me an expensive bottle of perfume and i just said to him what a waste of money why did you buy that for me it's just so unnecessary and he was so hurt because he had actually saved up for three weeks to buy me this bottle of perfume and he couldn't understand that that presents were not my love language so let's talk about love languages and for those of you who don't know love languages please google it and do the test yourself so that you know not only what your love language is but your partner's love language it's absolutely essential that you know the love language of your partner at business and at home so the first one is words of affirmation. I find most people have words of affirmation as their love language. They want you to tell them how great they are, how marvelous they are, how wonderful they are. 
And it's so difficult for people like me because that's not my love language. And people say to me, oh, my God, you're so great. You're so wonderful. You're so marvelous. And they say, well, you didn't seem very grateful when I said all those nice things about you. And I said, because it's not my love language. So, um, but for instance, my son, that's his love language. You've got to tell him, Richard, you did a great job. You did marvelously well. And then he'll go on and do better. If you say you did a terrible job, he won't even do it again, you know. So you've got to understand that's the, the first love language. My daughter has gifts. Now, with her, you can give her a gift. And it was my, not mine, as you know, with the bottle of perfume story. With my daughter, so if you go in with a lovely gift oh my gosh this is so you are thinking of me you put effort into this gift i'm so grateful you know this is my love language my mother's time i've got to spend time with her don't tell me how much you've got don't bring me presents i just want you to come and sit and i want you to have a conversation with me and this conversation could go on forever and as you know i'm busy and i can't take hours and hours for this conversation but like yesterday i had an hour and i went and i spent it with her and she just said to me thank you so much for coming it means such a lot to me that you took time to come and sit with me so that's um time um and my husband is touch. He's a touch me. He always touch you, you know, feel that I'm a bit of a touch me not, which is a really odd combination for us to be. So he'll always touch me and he'll shake hands, he'll pat you on the shoulder. So touch is his love language. If I want to, I'll, I'll, I'll hug him, you know, I'll, I'll be, I'll go around and, and I'll touch him. And he, to him, that is his love language. And then mine is acts of kindness. So I like people to do things for me. So you'll see when I get to, to my branch, the staff will come out, they'll carry my bags. They will help me to do something. Um, and that's my love language. And they all know that. And that's, that's so that they know that they don't buy me gifts or anything. They can, or rather do something nice for me. So those are the love languages. Now, Stacey, how important are love languages in your life? And do you work around them? Had you heard of them before? And have you, do you know what yours is? Yes, Margaret. I actually, I love the subject of love languages. Um, I actually wrote a blog on love and incorporated love languages a couple of months ago. So I'll post it on um, just for people to read. But um, it was definitely something we did as a couple, my husband and I, before we got married. So, I mean, 15 years ago, we did the love languages. And it's been really interesting. Actually, it turned out that I kind of was all the love languages. Uh, oh, really? um, I had two top ones and then the other three were kind of like one point apart so he said to me what am I going to do like how do I do all of them for you but saying that I said to him actually you know acts of service definitely is my number one so the same if you do something kind for me it's, it means the world to me whereas I'm not a huge words of affirmation either I mean obviously you I think we all enjoy an aspect of them a little bit. Okay, maybe not not you with gifts, Margaret, but, <laughs> but yeah. But I, I definitely say every couple needs to do the quiz and find out, and then research each other's and also friendship groups and your children, like you said, and just knowing people's um, the, their expressions is so important for relationship building. Uh, Paula, do you ever deal with love languages and is it something that you ask clients to do? Definitely, depending on the situation um, with the client and what it is that they've come to me for and what they're working on, but absolutely, learning to talk each other's love language will play a huge role in terms of how fulfilled and happy you feel in your relationship because that brings you closer together. It makes you feel loved and makes you feel special. It makes you feel validated and nurtured and all of those kind of things. Margaret, you'll be happy to know that um, Gary Chapman, who founded the Five Love Languages, has now done the Five Love Languages in the workplace. And I'll just um, pop it oh. in the chat. Um, so he's expanded that now, and he's now brought it into the workplace, and he's done Five Love Languages of Appreciation in the workplace, wow. um, which I'm busy working with at the moment with the, the work that I do in the corporate space. So, yeah, love makes the world around, not money, right? <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, it's just amazing. And I think if you understand the love languages, so and we're going to put the link to the ordinary one in the chat as well. So if you haven't done your love language, please do the quiz and you've got to be 100% honest, you can't fib, and then it'll come out and then you, you know, and if you with somebody, do that test with them. If you go into a new relationship, do the test as well so that you know what ticks their boxes and what doesn't. I think that's really, really important. Now, let's just go on to relationships in the workplace. And when I say relationships, relationships that shouldn't happen. I mean, you, you've got a lovely wife. She's sitting at home, but she's had three kids. She looks a bit frumpy. You leave and she's in her pajamas. You get home and she's in her dressing gown with a towel on her head. But all day you're at work with these beautiful women who have had their makeup done, they're wearing the latest clothes, they've got little slinky bodies 
what are you going to say to the men out there when they're looking at these girls and thinking, oh my goodness, this looks so appealing. And when you get home, you've got the wife with a cigarette hanging out of her mouth saying, oh God, I hope you want some supper tonight. You know, <laughs> well, let's talk to the men first, because, you know, men like to have a beautiful woman on their arm. They like to be proud of their wife. They like to have a magnificent body to get into bed with. And maybe she's not providing those things what are you saying to the woman out there who's sitting there with a cigarette hanging out their mouth and three kids in the backyard and and still in their pajamas now how do you handle that one paula when you see it and you say Whoa, i'm not surprised he ran away <laughs> i think at the end of the day there's nothing wrong with appreciating another human being um in terms of you know if they take care of themselves and those kind of things it's yeah. like you know window shopping but you don't have to purchase and yeah. And, and when I see someone that's taking care of themselves and looking after themselves, I appreciate the fact that they're doing that. And for me, I think it comes back to self-respect. When you yeah. look after yourself and take care of yourself, and I'm just talking basic things like personal grooming and, and you know, making an effort for your partner, then yes. your partner, and, and I'm using this on both sides because I've had situations where women have had affairs too, but it also comes down to the fact that you're not meeting your partner's needs um, and that's what causes a partner to look elsewise um, elsewhere but it's yeah. understanding that when you make a commitment to somebody and a relationship that is a lifetime commitment and yeah. if you cross that line you need to be fully aware of the consequences that come with crossing that line and what that can mean for you for both parties and family yeah. if you have children involved as well so if you are thinking about crossing that line, you need to ask yourself why. Because as I said earlier, people don't have affairs for no reason. It's because their needs are not being met in their relationship. And that's where couples need to have those honest conversations. I call them courageous conversations. And there's three simple little questions that you can use every month as a check-in with each other, which is what's working well in our relationship and how do we keep doing more of this? What areas can we improve on in our relationship, which is very different to what's not working? Because when we ask that question, that can open Pandora's box. And before you know it, you get stuck in that blame game because we can very quickly point out what our partner's not doing. Yeah. So this is very important to say, what areas can we improve on? Because that makes it a joint responsibility and a joint exercise. Yeah. And then the third one is, how can I be a better partner for you? Because we never ask our partners those questions. Yes. Yeah. And That's if you good, use those like. three, yeah, if you use those three simple questions and you check in with each other once a month or on your date nights, I like to call them date times, when you're spending time together, that will be a checklist to keep you on the same page and keep your relationship healthy and ways to grow together. Yes. Now you know a lot. Sorry, carry on, Stacey. So Paula, um, sorry, I just want to ask if somebody is struggling and having like almost a bit of an emotional affair in their brain at work, do you think they should go home to their wife and or their husband, vice versa, and have the conversation? Say, I am struggling. I'm struggling with a colleague at work. Um, this is what I'm going through emotionally and have be honest before it actually happens or do you think it's something that they should just work on on their own what are your thoughts so i definitely think you need to sit and reflect and go why why am i attracted to this person or why am i connected to this person what is it about this person that i'm potentially not getting in my relationship or is it my own stuff because sometimes it can be our own stuff and not necessarily our partner in our relationship and so first of all, from a self point of view, sit down and reflect on what's going on here. Why am I doing this? Why am I behaving or reacting or responding in this way? And what, are, what is this costing me in terms of from a self point of view, but also from a relationship point of view? And then if it is something to go and sit down with your partner and see how your partner can help you and support you through it, because potentially there's something going on in your relationship that could be improved on. That if that was happening in your relationship, you wouldn't be looking elsewhere or being connected to someone else. Yeah. And I think a lot of time people grow apart. You know, you, you meet when you're 16, 17, you have this lovely relationship, you get married, you have kids. And then, and of course, the next thing we're going to talk about is midlife crisis. The man goes along and suddenly one day he wakes up, he says, oh my God, I'm over 40. Is this what life's all about? I've got these kids that I'm running around with all the time. I've got this wife who's becoming old and frumpy. Um, I want more from life. And that's when they start buying sports cars and Holly Davidsons. And, and that's when they usually have, if they're going to have their fair, that's when it usually happens. So I think if the wife is, is 
wide awake, she'll pick it up. I mean, I wouldn't miss a trick if it was me. But um, you know, but sometimes they get so involved. I'm running to the school meeting, and I'm running to here, I'm running to there, that they don't see what's going on. But um, you know, how, Paula, what do you think that that women should be looking for to see this? My husband's now 40, 45. He's going through this midlife crisis. Where does that leave me? Yeah, that, that's a very important thing, Margaret, because that is often what happens with couples is they grow apart instead of growing together because they just get caught up in the daily grind of life and trying to just battle or struggle and juggle with day-to-day -day life, um, kids, family, work, careers, etc. So some of the signs to look out, and this goes both ways because women are becoming more um, independent in terms of choosing to stay or to go. And a lot of women lose themselves in their relationship. They lose their sense of self, their sense of identity and who they are, their self-confidence, self-worth, self-esteem. It's not that different when it comes to men because as you know, I run both men's and women's personal growth and development programs. And men struggle with similar issues, but they just act it out differently to women because we talk about it. We've been conditioned to talk about it. Men will act it out. They'll go out drinking with the boys or they will buy the fancy cars or the fancy toys and the gadgets. Um, and they will think that, um, you know, finding a 20 year old or trading it in for, you know, the current partner is going to bring them um, more excitement and adventure and, and fun. But yeah. the reality is, is you could co-create that with your current partner if you were willing to sit down and do that work. And that's where couples grow apart. We lose the spontaneity. We lose um, couples' goals, working together and doing things together that gives you a sense of we're on the same page, same team. We're working towards something. Um, and growing together as a couple as well as individuals, often we will invest in our own development and one will partner will outgrow the other one as opposed to growing together in your relationship and living disconnected lives. So Hush nadu has got a question here. He says, it's both ways. I'm a single dad and my wife did that. Woke up and said, oh, I want a new sports car. And she left. That was it. She was gone. Now, um, Hush, did, uh, asked you, did you not see that coming? Did, did it, do you think it just happened overnight? Or do you think she'd been, and you can put your camera on if you want to talk to us or if you want us to just answer you, we will. But, you know, we've got to ask you a couple of questions. And, and the question, of course, is did you see it coming? Was there anything she was complaining about? Um, did she, she, she started to feel that she was, you know, she started gymming all the time and going out. What was the story? Can you come in and tell us? Do you want to, or just if you did put there? Oops. Good morning, everybody. Um, no, it, literally, it was a, it was a little, it was literally a, a surprise. Uh, we yeah. were happy in December. Yeah. And then in January, February, she just decided she didn't want to be married anymore. Oh, it gosh. was. I didn't see it coming at all. I don't think any of my family even saw it coming. Nobody saw it coming. It just happened over. I think, okay, I was quite busy. I was, I'm a photographer by trade. So I was very busy trying to build my business and trying to get things going and all those things. Mm. And I think she just, yeah, she just decided. To... I always say to men, women need a lot of attention, not just a little bit of attention. They need a lot of attention all the time. I mean, I'm a quite a demand person. Oh. Where does go? Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm a demanding person, so I actually demand a lot of attention. But I think a lot of women don't demand attention. They wait for you to offer it. And if the man's not offering it, then they start to think, mm, I, I'm out of here. I know that my, my uh, sister-in-law and brother-in-law were married for 37 years. And they both knew after three weeks that they'd made a mistake. And neither would admit to the other that they'd made a mistake. And they lived together for 37 years. And only after that time did they say, you know what, I knew... 36 years and 49 weeks ago that I'd made a mistake and we just carried on. So um, how long, Paula, do people carry on? I know you said it's usually about two years that they've been thinking about breaking up before they actually do break up. Um, what are the signs usually? I mean, Hush didn't see any signs, but there must have been signs that she was feeling unwanted, unloved, unaccepted, or just that there was more adventure out there for her. Margaret, absolutely, there are always signs, but often we miss them because we're not paying attention to them. So the common thing that comes up is women always nag. Um, <laughs> that's the common feedback is women will nag about you never spend time with me or you're always working or you're always out with your boy drinking or you're always um, cycling or sport or gym or something. 
And what's really going on underneath, that's just a smoke screen. What's really going on underneath there is I'm feeling alone and lonely in our relationship. I'm not feeling val validated or appreciated. And I'm, I'm not feeling a priority because you're spending time with everything else and everyone else and not me, us and, and our family. So that's from a woman's side. Men, they don't talk about those things, so they will start acting it out in different ways. As I said, they will either just shut down and withdraw completely because men haven't been taught um, through the gender stereotyping and conditioning around how to speak about emotional things. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they will use different kinds of language. But mm -hmm. yeah, some of the signs are when they do start taking care of themselves, start working out, um, losing weight, getting fit, getting healthy, spending more time at work or spending more time, you know, um, outdoors, doing things sporty, active wise, those kind of things. Um, that's when, when it does happen because the opportunity is there. It's not that they're intentionally mm -hmm. looking for it, but over time they start getting their needs met in this other environment or this other external place that they're yeah. not getting a relationship. Yeah. Now, Stacey, just come back to Connectable Life. There's so many different specialists in different ways. So when you chat to a new person, do you sort of ask them, they said, oh, look, my relationship's in tatters. You know, I don't know what to do. They come to you, you can put me onto somebody, you can put them onto to Paula, or there are other people with other forms of expertise. How do, what questions do you ask them to find out what sort of person, um, you know, the, the woman might be absolutely crackers. You know, you say, maybe you should go to a psychologist, my girl, or something like that. How do you work out who to put them onto? We actually have a questionnaire that uh, people would fill out and then we've got um, a type of formula that we use and then we will just match with who we feel would be the best fit. So, um, you know, the different specialists have their categories, uh, whatever it might be, and very often different specialists cover a few categories. Um, so then we will advise, sometimes we'll advise just one specialist. So we'll just say, okay, just go to Paula or we will advise three specialists, you know, depending also on price range, like what the person wants. And then the person will go and watch the little video, um, read up on the bio, and then they will book it from there. So uh, we try and advise best we can, but I mean, we also, we only have um, knowledge of the specialists that we've directly worked with, like Paula. I mean, we've worked with quite a few. And I mean, I've been to Paula as a life coach, so I can vouch for her. I've sent many, uh, yeah, I often advise people to go to Paula. So, um, yeah, so it, it, at the end of the day, it boils down to personal preference and what a person's looking for, the budget they're wanting, the, also the time slots that they are needing. Um, but yeah, we, we advise in regards to what people answer and what the specialists uh, cater for. Now, Paula, as a life coach, you know, people um, in the past never went to a life coach, but now it's become very fashionable to have a life coach. You know, everybody has a coach. You've got um, Marlene Powell, who I work with, an action coach. She coaches businesses, but in turn, she has um, Glenda, who is her lifestyle coach. She has, a, she has a fitness coach. She has lots of different coaches. When people come to you, um, do they have certain expectations of you? Like, I'm coming to you as a, a life coach. Are you going to send me to exercise? Are you going to tell me to lose weight? Are you going to tell me to work on my own? what sort of things do you ask people when they come to you as, and, and need, I realize that my life isn't perfect. This is how I'd like it to be. Um, can you make this happen for me? What do you say to them? Yeah, so Margaret, um, definitely. When someone comes to me, I first do a, a diagnostic session with them in terms of really understanding what is it that they are feeling that they need help with or that they are wanting to work on. <laughs> If it falls within my area of expertise, then I will absolutely give them options in terms of because I work in very different ways, you know, individual sessions, group programs, workshops, etc. Otherwise, I refer into my my network of, of people that I work with. So, for example, I don't work with children. So, if people come to me and say, "Do you work with children?" I say, "Absolutely no," but I can refer you to my colleague who I know um, who works with children. It's her area of specialty. And just like we are ourselves, each person, you know, we are not an expert in everything. And therefore, it's finding the right person that can help you with what it is that you are needing help with. And then um, building that relationship with that person, because it's not a, and often when it's couples, and I'm generalizing, yeah, based on how they answer my questions, I know that they're looking for a quick fix. And then I very 
very, very quickly say, well, sorry, there's no such thing as a quick fix. Your relationship didn't break down overnight. It's yeah. bro it broke down over 10, 12, 15, 20 years, however long they've been together here. And so if you're expecting a quick fix, then I'm sorry, but this isn't actually going to work because at the end of the day, they're going to go away and go, oh, yeah, but we went to Paula and she couldn't help us. And it's not necessary that I couldn't help them. It's that they were looking for a quick fix and they had unrealistic expectations. So I think it's also important to be aware of what are your expectations when you are going to someone to help you with what you're needing help with. Yeah. Now, what if you're working with a couple and they've got really naughty kids? They come along and say, listen, we're having such problems as a, as a couple, but you look at their kids and they're really naughty. Now, I always say there's no such thing as a naughty child. There's only a child whose parents haven't taught them properly. Um, what do you say to them in that regard? Because you, you don't want to work with, you don't, you don't work with the children, but you can yeah. see that the, the kids are so flipping naughty that this is causing problems in this relationship. How do you handle that one? So kids act out what they're experiencing at home. And when couples come to me and it's the kids are an issue, so there's, there's two different contexts where, where couples come to me. One, it's, it's a couple and their children, and invariably the children are acting out what's going on in the relationship between the adults. Because children, depending on the age, obviously, they mimic parents' behavior. And mm -hmm. so then I work with a colleague of mine, she works with the kids, I work with the couple, and we try and re-revision re, um, re the, the family unit and the couple by creating a safe space for the kids and a safe environment and a healthy environment for the kids to grow up in. Because that's where we learn how to be in a relationship. And all the kids are going to do is perpetuate that behavior and take it into their adult relationships. On the other hand, when it's a blended family, now a blended family is where one or both partners have been in a previous relationship and they've got children and they're coming together and blending two families. That's a different scenario because often they, they don't blend it equally or fairly. So it ends up being a them and a us, your kids, my kids, and there's different sets of rules. And that just creates a toxic environment for the kids and the couple because then everybody is at each other's throats and it doesn't create a healthy home environment for anybody to grow up in. Yeah. And then, as you say, the kids um, come in with, with all those things that they've brought in. Now, what I did in my family is I broke that whole mold. You know, my family had come with this mold, this mold, and, and been for generations. And I just looked at them and said, I am not going to be in this, this type of relationship. I'm not going to have this type of relationship. I'm going to have a different type of life. You know, they were always poor. They felt it was virtuous to be poor. They thought that rich people were rude and showed off and that. And I just said, I'm going to break this whole thing. And I broke everything. I changed the relationships. I changed our financial position. I changed everything because I broke that mold. When you see people coming and you've seen this, this thing repeating itself, repeating itself, how do you say to them, maybe it's time you broke the mold? Yeah, definitely. And so it's there's various different approaches that I use, but you can also see if the person is willing to do the work or not. Um, yes. Some people are afraid of doing the work. They're afraid to face themselves in the mirror and go, yes, maybe I am the problem in my own relationship or in my own life because I'm standing in my way. And yeah. um, there's fear of failure, but there's also fear of success. Some people don't believe they deserve that success. So they play it small and they hold themselves back. And we're taught failure in school. And we take that on board that we're a failure and everything that happens to us, we internalize it and take it personally as, well, I'm a failure. But Margaret, as you know, failure is an event, not a person. Yes. So listen to the feedback that you're getting and use that feedback to change the outcome going forward. You don't have to keep doing the same thing over and over again because then that becomes a choice. Yes. Yeah. Now let's talk about change because you want, you know, if you're in a relationship or a situation that you're not happy with, you have to change. But change is uncomfortable. Change, you've got to get out of your comfort zone. It's uncomfortable. And as you say, you've got to do the work. And inherently, people are lazy. You know, what's the quickest, easiest route to do this? There's no quick and easy route to something that's fantastic. So, you know, that's what I always tell people. And uh, for me, the one I get the most is, you know, Margaret, you're rich and successful. I, I want to be that way too. Just, you just, what do you mentor me? And I'll just be that way. And they, their vision of mentoring is that I will do all the work and then they'll just come in and take the glory. And I said, it doesn't work like that either. So how do you, when you, people, you can see that they really want to change, but they're just too lazy to do the actual work. How do you deal with that situation? That's when I bring out the tough love card, <laughs> similar, similar to the way that you do it, you know, um, in that I can't come and fix your relationship for you and I am not God. Um, I can't perform miracles, but I can give you tools and insights and, and, and templates and everything to use. 
But the real true test of success is when you walk out of my office and you apply that in your home environment or your personal life or whatever it might be, because that's where you're going to get the results. And what you put in is what you're going to get out. And if you're not willing to do the work and use the information and the tool that I'm giving you, then unfortunately, you're not going to get the results that you say you want, which tells me you don't want it badly enough because you're not prepared to do what it takes to get it. Yeah, and yeah. I think they have to work it badly enough. Hey, uh, Stacey, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And the thing is, for me, it's to ask yourself the question, is this going to help me? So to have something in your life where you, like some phrase that, is this going to help me? Is this going to make me achieve my goal? And to have that phrase and ask it when you're doing certain things. So is this going to help me? Yes, it is. Okay, I'm going to do it. Is this going to help me? No, it's not. Okay, I'm not going to do it. So to have that phrase in your life and to couple yourself with somebody like a life coach who is going to hold you accountable ask mm-hmm. you those questions, give you those tools and um, encourage you to go forward with it. You know, very often we need that roadmap. We need that guidance. And when we in this situation, we can't necessarily see it. Whereas mm-hmm. when there's somebody else looking f- from an outsider's perspective, they can see the direction we need to take. And they're going to, you know, if, if you are like consulting a, a life coach, they're going to give you the best advice. They are going to see what might be difficult and tell you the road to get onto and how to do it. Whereas when it's yourself, you won't necessarily see it or want to, you you don't want to do the hard work sometimes. Whereas when there's somebody pushing you, a coach, you know, makes the road and journey easier. So I think for those of you out there say, I want to get a coach, but you know, she's going to ask me these questions and I don't know the answers. So Shane, will you just put up my little spiral? This is a little thing that I use and it just shows you where you are. And it's something that you can use all the time because um, it, it gives you the breakdown and you'll see, oh, if Shane, if Shane, you're still there? You're coming? Oh, goody, yes. So there we are. And it's all labeled. Mm-hmm. So the reason you have goals is you can't hit a target you can't see that's number one number two you have to have it um, done through so the little spiral below shane thank you slide number two um is these are the things that that are, are important to me firstly my health and fitness very very important gratitude we spoke about gratitude are you grateful for what you've got you know, or you just think, oh, I deserve this. Your life vision, have you got a vision for your life? Or are you just going from day to day, eating, sleeping, watching days of other people's lives? Are your career, are your career, what is it? Where are you in your career? Are you re- doing the job you want to do or you're, do you hate what you do every day? Your financial life, most important, you have to be financially independent. And it's just so important for every woman to be 100% financially independent. Your social life, you know, you have to have a social life as a woman. You can't just live with your, you're just you and your husband, you and your husband. You've got to have women to talk to. As women, we like to chew the cud, you know. We just tell the same story. My husband says to me, you've told me that already. I, I know, but I just want to tell you again, you know. And, you, and, and I just want to tell you the story. You don't have to give me the answer, but I just like to. Well, you can do that with your girlfriends. I mean, I have my girlfriends, um, we have a chat for an hour or two on the phone. And, you know, we just go through everything. Parenting, are you, what are you like as a parent? Do you think you're fantastic? fantastic parent or are you struggling with parenting your love relationship the most important thing in your life is your love relationship how's that going your spiritual life you know do you have a spiritual life where you just think oh you know and of course you know that the old story when you say do you believe in god and you say no you, you always are lying so you believe in a god somewhere along the line your character is your character you know that's why um Michelle Obama wrote her book as Becoming. She's becoming the woman she wants to be. Your emotional life, are you living on your emotions? Are you up and down all the time? Or are you, what do you are? Do you give back to charity? You know, it's all about giving back. And if you don't give back anything, you just, you, you don't feel good. So uh, this is a spiral that I use. So you rate yourself on a scale of one to 10. And when you've done that, you join the dots and you'll see where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are. Now you think I'm going to say work on your weaknesses. I'm not, I'm going to say hone in on your strengths because as you get stronger on what you're really good at, 
the others just automatically get stronger. And that's really, really what it's all about. So uh, just quickly, I um, just want to show you um, these two ladies are both 74 years old. And when, uh, sorry, Shane, why don't you just show that side? These two ladies are both 74 years old. Which one do you want to be? Now, the mm -hmm. thing is, they didn't start deciding, the one on, on the um, left didn't start deciding today she wanted to look like that. She was like that her whole life. She exercised her whole life. She worked hard at herself. The other one moaned, complained, um, you know, was grumpy, just, you know, got sick all the time and just, you know, it was awful. So you have a choice of you, which one you want to be. And you make that choice today. It's not a choice that you make when you're 74. You make that choice today. Most important. Your relationships, as I said, you have been married for 50 years. That's, and I would say we took it for our Christmas uh, thing. This it's, it's, it's half baked because Merry Christmas goes on the side there. We've been together for 50 years and we're happier today than we were when we actually got married. We get on so much better. We are best friends and we just, we know that we will always support each other on and on. Your family is so, so important. You know, here it's a picture of us and my children. Um, and uh, to me, my true wealth is bringing up really good children who in turn are bringing up good children who, who know, have good values in life who do the right things and do things right. So I think it's really important that you do that. Your job and your career is important to you. Your job is what you do, but your career is what you'd really like to do. Which way do you want to push your life? And of course, money. People say money is not important. I want to tell you, money does make the world go around. Love makes it go around, but you need three things in life, water, oxygen, and money. You've got those three things. You're fine. You're short of one. You're in big, big trouble. And I think it's nice. Why do we need money? Because we, we like material goods. You know, people say, oh, you know, you're so flashy with your Porsche. I love my Porsche. And I, I work long and hard for it. And I love my beautiful homes. I love the beautiful stuff that I've got. And to me, that makes me happy. And that's why I work. So I, I don't feel guilty about it at all. Your spiritual life, it doesn't matter if you pray to God, Buddha, Allah, Krishna, Rama, Jehovah. So long as you pray to somebody, you know, there's a greater being up there looking after you. And, you know, it's so it's important to give back. So when you get your every hundred rand, you've got to save 10 rand, you've got to invest 10 rand, and you've got to give 10 rand back to charity. No matter how little you've got, you've always got to help somebody else along the way. And just remember, it's never too late. Um, I got my master's, as you know, when I was 70. And, um, and I had to do it online. It was hectic. Um, I, you know, it just to me, the most stressful part of the exam wasn't passing. It was, was making sure that I set my questionnaire off and it went into the right place. So, um, and I started um, 10 years before that. I started when I was 60. I got my business degree. I got my honors, my postgrad, and then I went on to do my master's. So it's never too late to mend. You've got to know that wherever you are in your life, you can do it. So what, what are you going to do today to make sure that you live the life of your dreams? Everyone wants to eat, but very few are willing to hunt. Everybody wants to be wealthy, but they're not prepared to put in the effort it takes to be wealthy. So just a quick wrap up now. Um, Stacey, from you, from your side, quick wrap up on today. What you just said right now, Margaret, it was so powerful. What are you going to choose today? And that's mm -hmm. it. We need to make the choice. We need to have that decision that we are going to change our life today. If you're not happy, if you are like, if your relationship is not good, what are you going to do about it? We can't just stay living in that unhappiness. So yeah, yeah that for me is the nail on the head. What are you going to do today to make the changes in your life and to help grow in happiness? And um, yeah, that's, that's what I think. Okay, Stacey, won't you just look and see who our speaker is for next week, please? And then Paula, just a quick wrap up from you on today. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. I think, you know, at the end of the day, life is about choices and you get to choose how you want to live your life as an individual, from a relationship point of view, from a career point of view. And in, in amongst those three key areas are all the things that you've alluded to already, Margaret. And when it comes to couples, to just say that couples' goals are equally important as career goals and personal goals. Okay. And if you don't have that roadmap to help you build your healthy relationship, um, okay. then you're not going to have a healthy, happy relationship. And that's one of the things that I do in terms of the, the, the work that I do is offering couples a roadmap to be able to build healthy relationships. And yes. I've just put, um, dropped the link in the, in the chat box that I'm, I run a six-week program for couples that gives them the roadmap to build a strong foundation in their relationship and to be able to weather the storms because life is a lifelong journey of learning, as you know, Margaret, you're the, you're the living proof of that. And your, <laughs> yes. your relationship is, a, is an ongoing journey. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey together. 
Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. It's about the journey together. Stacey, who's our speaker for next week? So next week, our speaker is Kirsten, and she is talking on man sex. Kirsten is a specialist recovery coach. Um, so yeah, she's going to take us through um, man sex and mindfulness and that whole journey, which is exciting. Yes, and I love it. Mind power is my most favorite, favorite thing with Robin Banks. I love Robin Banks and mind power. <laughs> How do you power your mind to just make exactly. things happen? And if you can take control of your mind, you can take control of your life and your life will yes. go the way you want it to go. So just this week, your homework, girls and boys, is to, to put out there exactly what you want. Write your goals down. Get that little wheel. I'll put it in on the chat and I'll put it in on my Facebook page as well. And join those dots and then work on your strengths. Forget your weaknesses. You know, I will never be able to dance or sing. No matter how many lessons I take, I will <laughs> never be able to dance yes. or sing. Um, I've got Warren offering me after watching my TikTok to say, Margaret, please come for me for dancing lessons. Warren, I'm not going to waste your time because I have two left feet. But, um, but just hone in on your strengths. What's my strength? My strength is making money. My strength is making people wealthy. That's what I do on a daily basis. I absolutely love it. I have amazing results. And guys and dolls, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Thank you so much, Paula, for being on our guest speaker today. You were amazing. Thank you, Stacey, you for setting this up. It was fabulous. We loved it. We're getting great um, talks here. I loved it. it was excellent says sandy um and a really great session guys so thank you carrie i'm glad you enjoyed it um please tell your friends and relations to watch it they can all watch on our facebook pages and let's have a wonderful week i'll see you next monday thank you girls thank you so much margaret